will come up. So that's six different things. Let's see. Somebody, uh, is, is the person in charge of this right here? So please stand up. So they are giving something called act wider, which is something to, to start through the act as heavy. So you know, if you do something like this, it is a pure code, you just click on it and you will have a schedule of the particular room, minus 15 minutes plus 40 minutes, that's correct? Uh, okay, now we're up. So something like that. So please use it. Here's the guy who requests back everything to him. And that's just say You do the conference, you have got a question, and it will be around here, and the and the other one will have to be also around here. Now it's the turn of our geography. Let's go. And thank you very much. So, I'm going to get to online with the chef. Either way, I'm the keeper of the dawn, which you probably heard of once of you coming here. I will be loaning it to the organizers throughout the conference, so it's such a start, you'll be reminded to be in here. But the real reason we're going is here is we have lightning talks. Three sessions, one each day. Today's are already full. If you want, submitted one and got accepted for today, you should have gotten an email. And you should find that you have go to the schedule, well not schedule, the presentation page, which is slash talks. You'll be on the correct track, lightning day one. Please find me and tell me you're here so I can finish putting the actual order together for today. If you haven't, Submitted a lightning talk yet, you still have lots of room on the other two days. Put it in through act and come see me and say hello. When you do your lightning talk, you'll be up here. When you, you'll want to sit in the front row on this side and before our session come up, play with your laptop here and make sure everything's all good and sit back down. You'll get five minutes. At four minutes, you'll hear a bell ding. At five minutes, you'll hear a gong and you're done. And that takes care of all that side. But we also have lightning advertisements. During that gap in between the lightning talks when they're messing with their machines and we need to keep you distracted, we have short little advertisements, about 30 seconds. All you get is a microphone, nothing else to help. You don't have to you want just sit in the front row on that side. Okay. And also, okay. And that should be about it. Hopefully you'll be spending your talks. This is the... Uh, the... Uh, the... Uh, the uh, Yes. But 
Introduced? Okay. Hello. Good morning. Um, I guess there was a little bit of chaos setting this up. Um, I am here to talk about something that is a little bit out of the way of what a lot of people who program in Perl or any other language often talk about. Um, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about who I am. Um, some of you might have heard me talk at Perl conferences before about strange things to do with medieval manuscripts and evolutionary biology. Uh, there will be a little of that in this talk. Yeah? Uh, okay. Can someone help me with the mic, actually? Okay. Why am I wearing this? Yes, this is for the camera. Ah, ah, okay, so I have to be here. Okay, I'm using two mics, what do you know? Um, all right, and so, some, of you, some of you actually knew me before I was, had anything to do with manuscripts and was just pl a plain old Perl hacker. Um, so basically, I'm a computer scientist turned into a historian who has yet to decide whether history or hacking is more fulfilling, and as a result, half the time I'm now teaching humanities students how to program, which I can tell you is an adventure. Um, this is what I study. I study the history of Byzantium and medieval Armenia. Byzantium, well, you see where Istanbul was, Constantinople is. Um, Armenia as it was is a little bit to the west of Armenia as it is, and so when I talk about Armenia, normally I'm talking about roughly that area. And I also look at it around the time of the First Crusade when a lot of Armenians and other people were all banging around here. So how do we write history? Um, well, historians get information from lots of places. There's archaeology. We have to look at artifacts that come up out of the ground and figure out what they are and what people were using them for. From art, um, I found out recently, this is a miniature from an Armenian manuscript that's just been digitized by a manuscript in Birmingham. Would you believe that that is actually a representation of God? Who knew that they actually represented God the Father in medieval manuscripts? I found this out the other day. I thought that was great. Um, oops. Or stone inscriptions. This is an inscription on the wall of the city wall of the city of Edessa, in, which is now um, Shanli Urfa in Turkey. And that is talking about what the governor of the city was organizing in 1122 to keep the city safe. And finally, we have text. Text is probably the most important way that we study history. We have to, people wrote down what, in their opinion, was going on or what they wanted other people to believe was going on. And these texts have come down to us and we look at them and we read them and we decide how much we can believe any person who is writing whatever, whatever that person is writing. So this brings me to my first war story, which, is, which concerns the text that I work on and why it's important. Um, I, work on a, I work on a historian who worked, who worked in the early 12th century in the city of Edessa when the First Crusade came through town. He was Armenian. Um, he wrote a chronicle talking about this amazing thing that had happened with a bunch of Westerners coming up and arising and taking Jerusalem and, and showing the Muslims who was boss or some, some such. And his chronicle is important because it is the only one that was written by an eyewitness to what was going on who was not Latin and not Greek and not Muslim. He was a local Christian, Eastern Christian, one of, these, one of these rare creatures, and he talked a lot about what was going on from his perspective, which makes his history pretty important for, for comparing it to the other histories that we have. Now, And so this is, this is a scene of, of when 
Baldwin, the, the, the crusader prince who took Edessa, actually came and, and the gates were opened for him to invite him into the city. Um, so Matthew wrote about all this, but then what happened to his text? Well, I have to, I have to stop here and say that um, in the West we're a little bit lucky. This is, this is a picture of the last sack of Paris, which was in 845 by the Vikings. Paris hasn't been sacked, by, sacked since then. It's great for Paris. Rome hasn't been quite so lucky. This is a picture of the last time Rome was sacked in 1517, but there was an important thing about when Rome was sacked, which is that, um, which is that the Habsburg emperor who was sacking it decided he was going to set up his headquarters in the Vatican Library, which meant that the Vatican Library didn't get burned, which meant that there was a lot of history we didn't lose. Um, other people aren't so lucky. I mean, that. Oh, none of you laughed. I'm so disappointed. Every time, I, every time I see the Lord of the Rings and I see the, um, I see the Battle of Helm's Deep, I am always, always, always reminded of what it must have been like at the fall of Constantinople. So Constantinople was sacked in 1453. It was also sacked in 1204. Um, lots of history was lost. Lots of documents were burned. Lots of, um, lots of things happened. And this was, this was the way of life in in that area in these times. With, and at the time, this is how text publication worked. I missed. Yeah, this is how text publication worked. Sorry, I got lost in my slides. Um, the, you had to copy a text by hand. And you had to put it on a shelf. And if someone else wanted a copy, they, someone had to take it down and copy it out by hand and give the new copy on. And this is how text spread. So you can imagine that when warfare and pillage and fires and stuff came through, then it really was not good for the preservation of texts. Matthew's text was written here. It was probably copied and spread places like here. None of these places were safe in the centuries that followed. So as a result, the, the first copy that we have of Matthew's text comes from 1590. From 1127 to 1590, we have, no, we have no intermediate record of his text. And this is what we, what we have to work with. Now, there are many other copies since then, but there is this 450-year gap between the time when Matthew was writing and between every single word of his that survives, as you can. So, I'm going to leave that story there for a minute, and I'm going to talk about another sort of problem of, okay, this is getting ahead of me, of instability or fragility or transience. I work on a tool called StemaWeb. StemaWeb is a piece, a, a suite of software tools that I have written and that I've had some help from writing, some from, from companies represented in this room, um, to let scholars work on Medieval, ancient and medieval texts, which is to say, to let them work on the, um, they have a bunch of copies of texts and they want to understand how these texts are related and they want to, they want to examine how these texts change and vary. That's what this is for. So for me, this is a text. I'm going to have to back away from the microphone to explain it a bit, but imagine that you have five manuscript copies of a text they all are the same text, but they were all written by hand, so they're all a little bit different. And so you can imagine that um, every text has a beginning, and every text has a set of words. Each of these little colored bubbles is a set of words, is a word. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what a good idea. Um, and every, every manuscript, which is to say every witness, takes, um, takes some path through the words from the beginning of text to the end. And so you can see how the, the variant graph, th this, I call this a variant graph. It is a kind of network of the text as it happened. I shouldn't get too close to the other microphone. Um, so in fact, yes, we can be all hipster with our graph databases in the humanities, um, just like everybody can in, in programming. But those of us who do programming in the humanities, those of us who use software tools to try to engage with the problems that we're trying to look into, we have some special challenges to deal with. Um, when I started writing this piece of software, I depended on a 
what I thought was fairly sensible, well-entrenched library. You see that I think of text as graphs, and I think of text family trees as graphs, and so it was only natural that I should use a library called graph, which had all of the functionality I wanted to represent this model. And then I had a problem that says, as of release 0.95, this module is unsupported. Um, well, as you can imagine, especially in the humanities, they don't really give a lot of, funding bodies don't give a lot of money for maintenance of software. So this graph library still works, but somehow, eventually, the software is going to stop working, and there's not a lot I can do about it until or unless I manage to engineer a way to get some money to devote to the problem. And similarly, I made another design decision at the outset. I, I think of my data as graphs, and so I had, this, had these graph data objects, and I didn't want to have to try and figure out how to put them in an SQL schema to save them and, and retrieve them. And I found this great thing called KyokuDB, and I thought, it's a Perl object storage database. That's great. I love it. I'm going to use it. Uh, the only problem is that it isn't, doesn't work entirely, and the um, IRC channel was dead. And so now I have these memory leaks in the code. And let me tell you, one thing that a humanities researcher does not have time to track down is memory leaks. <laughs> it's, it's a problem. And then, of course, there's testing. Now, I have a background as a professional software engineer. This gives me a great advantage, which is that I know how to write tests. Most people working in the humanities, no, they don't know how to write tests. So, um, so when you, as I said, I teach humanities people to, to program, and these people in the humanities, they are excited to learn how to program, and they like to make things work, they don't like to make things fail. It really makes them nervous to make things fail. So as much as I would idealistically like to start with sort of test-driven learning to code, you really can't do that with most people. And so we really have to come up with another way. Um, so this is, my, this is basically what it comes down to, is that when people who are working in the digital humanities like me need to keep our jobs, we're supposed to be submitting papers, and we end up finding that maybe we have nothing but a pile of yak hair to submit, because that's all we've been doing for the past several years. There have been initiatives within the humanities to try to change this. There have been um, big infrastructures, small infrastructures, flexible infrastructures, overarching infrastructures. Some of these infrastructures, the ones that have produced more meetings than tools are still alive. The ones that have produced more tools than meetings are dead. Um, that is the problem that we face. Now, I know that this is a problem that is faced in pretty much every aspect of software development, but in the humanities, it becomes really obvious really quickly how really unstable a lot of our research and a lot of our work and a lot of our a lot of the results of our research and basically our cultural heritage are at risk here, and we still don't have a good answer for that. Okay, so back to the wars. I'm going to talk about a little bit about what we do with texts when we have lots of manuscript copies of them. Um, there is, since the 19th century, there has been a branch of science, history, called textual criticism. And the idea, well, actually, textual criticism goes back a lot longer, but this particular sort of schematics that I'm about to talk about starts in the 19th century. And the idea was that if you have a bunch of text copies and you have people writing them out by hand, then some of the scribes are going to make mistakes or they're going to make some sort of change to the text that then gets picked up by the next person to copy that copy. And so, and if you can identify where the text is different, and if you can moreover identify where, which one of those differences was not in the original, then you can start making a family tree like this. So that dot at the top represents the manuscript from which all of our surviving manuscripts are copied. Every time it branches, so there are two copies of that, and then two more copies of, of one of the ones over there until you get A, B, C, etc. And then the idea here is that if you had, then you can use this to start reconstructing the text, start trying to get back up to whatever was in that archetype up top. So if, for example, um, M 
and N1166 share a reading that isn't the same as all of the other manuscript tradition, then you have a pretty good bet that this, um, as, I'm sorry, if HK, M, and this one, if they all share a reading that is against everybody else, you can have a good bet that the, um, the reading that they don't have is probably the one that was original. You use the tree like this and you make it, you make, you recreate the text as best you can. And this is what textual criticism has been. Um, and you have to first find the variants, then you have to identify what they call the common errors. And you have to also be sure that the common errors in question won't have just been corrected by a later scribe. Because this is another problem, you know, the people who were writing these manuscripts, they weren't stupid. They knew what they were doing. And so if they came across a reading that was obviously wrong, then they might well be able to guess what the right reading should have been and just restore it, and that sort of messes up the tree. So you have to be sure also that this common error that you're looking at isn't coincidental or isn't, um, isn't, isn't fixable. But by the mid-20th century, a lot of people weren't so happy with this apparently self-serving judgment and interpretation inherent in this thing that was supposed to be like science. Um, this was supposed to be a wonderfully, scientifically, rigorously mechanical way of reproducing an ancient text, but it depended a lot on a scholar's judgment of, oh, no, no nobody would have guessed that, that this, reading, this reading here, you know, that um, honor actually meant horror, and nobody would have figured that out from context, and so I think these, these manuscripts are related, and therefore the obvious true reading is horror, and that means that this reading, this reading through, three paragraphs later that I liked better than the other reading can also be con considered to be the true reading. Um, so there was a tendency for stemmas to look like this. Tendency for stemmas to look like this, which is this one was copied twice, and 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 this one was copied twice. One was copied twice. Um, I won't go into the logic of why it works right now. You might be able to, to you, you might be able to see it after a little bit of, of thought, but basically when you have a stemma like this, it means that almost any reading, you can decide, you can make an argument in your head about which one was probably original and which one wasn't. And so when you have these bifurcated stemmas, then pretty much any reading that you like can be, can be shown to be original somehow, and then you can make the text however you like. Great, huh? Okay, so they tried another approach. Um, starting in about the mid 20th century and taking off especially as computers entered the field, um, they borrowed methods from evolutionary biology and this is the part that some of you may have heard me talk about before. The idea is that in evolutionary biology, you have a bunch of species, you sequence their DNA, you run, a, you run some statistical models to figure out what the minimum number of mutations would have had to be in order to make all of these species relate to each other and from there, you can kind of come up with an idea of what the, what the original species, the common ancestor, looked like. Well, you can kind of do the same thing with manuscripts if you, think, if you stop thinking about DNA sequences and start thinking about text sequences. You see where they differ, and you run the same sorts of models, and you can come up with a family tree that looks something like this. Now, it is also very bifurcated because that's the way the, that's the, way the math works, and it's unrooted, meaning that now that you have this, you have to decide where in, where in all of these nodes the archetype probably lies. And the way, the way this is usually done is that the scholars look for one or two things that are so obviously clearly copying errors that nobody could possibly argue with them, and they use that to figure out the orientation of this kind of stemma. Okay. But the problem is that this method of reconstructing text with a stemma really does need to rely on common error, because two manuscripts aren't related just because they have the same reading that was also the reading in the original. They're only related if they have the same reading that wasn't the reading in the original. And we have these issues with scribal intelligence. We have to know that the readings in question could not have just been, you know, you can't, use spelling mistakes for this sort of method because everybody has their own different spelling and it might be because they grew up in the same village under the same teacher that they use the same spelling and not because they're copying the same manuscript. Um, and all of these things are very hard to model with the, 
with the stomatic, well, they're very, they're very hard to model with the, um, with the evolutionary method. Um, and I this is an example of a reading, you know, scribal intelligence. Someone was reading this text and saw something about curiously electric and said, that can't be right. It must have been curiously eclectic that this that per person meant. This is the sort of correction that went on also in, in the times when pe texts were being copied by hand. And that's what, and that's what is so hard to model with the evolutionary approach. Okay, and that's what my Stemma web tool is actually all about. I'm trying to, I built a tool that both factions can use, as it were. You can make a Stemma either by the old fashioned way or by the evolutionary way, and you can look to see how, if, you, if, you have, if this is the family tree, then this is the way the readings progress down the family tree with all the pretty colors, and then you're forced to confront your decision. You're forced to look at each, at each place in the text where it varies and say, does this make sense? Does it make sense that this doesn't follow the stemma? Does it make sense that the scribe would have reverted this reading? And you have to actually look at it very carefully. Now, another thing that I'm very interested in is that as most of you in this room will probably immediately understand, even with things like spelling mistakes and, and errors that could be corrected, there is almost certainly some signal in that noise. At the moment in textual criticism, we are not trying to get any signal from these, from these noisy channels like spelling variation or like, or like easily correctable readings or anything like that. Um, and people have actually started to notice that actually spelling is not completely random in, te in textual copying. You can start using it to start seeing some lines, but we need a lot more and more complicated statistical models to be able to use it. And here I come to my second interlude on the theme of problem solving in the arts and humanities. Now there is a reason that humanities is so very well known as a computational backwater, and that is because our problems are really hard to solve. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this thing about falsehoods programmers believe about names, um, that people have exactly one canonical full name, people have exactly one full name that they go by, and then you're worrying about things like people's names being written in ASCII or any single character set or mapped in Unicode code points or um, case sensitive or case insensitive. I have a few extra ones for you. How about um, we have a name and we know the person the name is talking about? Um, we, you know, we, 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 know who, we know who this person means. Or people's names are written down correctly in the first place or there is such a thing as a correct way and an incorrect way to write down a person's name, or people who write the person's name agree on what the person's name actually is, or um, people who are named, you know, a person's name refers to a person who is real and not allegorical, not just made up out of a story. Um, there are, there, you know, and this is just, I'm just getting started with names. You know, we have to figure out not only whether this thing is a name. Oh, that's another one. This word is a name. You definitely know it. That's another falsehood that, that you might believe about names. Um, similarly, for, um, for time, there's this falsehoods programmers believe about time. And this one I especially liked because it made clear that Evidently, the only sort of falsehoods that programmers have to worry about about time or the only sort of difficulties that programmers have to worry about time are with times that are accurate and precise. I wish the times that I worked with could be accurate and precise. Do you know how much easier that would make my job? Okay, you say, but you can work with a time range, and surely that time range can be specified in some accurate and precise way, right? Not so much. Um, okay, well, maybe, well, okay, now we know that you have this, this problem with um, calendars, that the, Byzantian, the Byzantine scribes used the Byzantine calendar, and the scribes from around, um, from around Alexandria used the, um, use the Alexandrian calendar, 
And the scribes from Armenia used the Armenian calendar, which started in about 551 AD. And then there's also the Hydra dating, and there's also the fact that in the places under the old Roman Empire, they still used imperial indiction sometimes as the way to date, date manuscripts. And, but obviously, they're all systematic, so that means they're all going to agree, right? No. <laughs> um, okay, well, at least, at least people, when they used a calendar, at least they knew what date they were talking about, so they didn't make mistakes, right? And then you can get me started on geography. Um, geolocating is a wonderful thing. GIS and, and this way of mapping out the entire known world is great. And it's used in the humanities as much as it's used anywhere else to make models of where people moved and when people were in different places. And that's wonderful. Um, but the problem we have is some combination of geographic inaccuracy and names. We have old names for places. You know how I said that you have a name and you don't know whether it's a personal name or a place name? Well, that can happen. If you decide it's a place name, then, um, then it might be an old name. It might be a Syrian name. It might be an Armenian name, which are different from the current Turkish name. Um, if you're going to talk about a place that isn't a city, or a specific building, then you're getting into the problem of borders. How you define Byzantium. What, is, what does it mean to be Syria in 1127? Um, where does Syria start? Where does Syria end? There's no, there's no nation state called Syria. There's no king of Syria. Syria is just a territory that is partially ruled by some Muslim lords and partially ruled by some Armenians in different cities. But you still see in these texts, people say Syria, and you're still expected to know what that means. Um, and then also my favorite, which is allegorical places, places that do exist in reality, but also exist in the Bible. Um, so just to give a great, a great example, and the thing about technology is that you, it will usually give you an answer. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, the computer can tell me where this place is. And if you're not careful, then you can, you can do some serious weird stuff. So this is a little script I wrote, um, almost straight from, the, um, almost straight from the, the pod documentation for this Google Places module. And just searching out a place, you, I, can give it, I can give it an argument at the command line, and it will give me all of the places that it finds to, um, yeah, all, all of the places that it finds that, that match that name. And I can look to see where they are. So I tried it with Gion. Um, if you know your biblical literature, then you might know that out of, out of the Garden of Eden, there, flo there flowed four rivers. There was the Tigris, and the Euphrates, and the Pishon, and the Gihon. Everybody knows where the Tigris River is. Everybody knows where the Euphrates River is. There is some argument about the other two, but the general vague consensus is that the Pishon refers to the Ganges River and the Gihon refers to the Nile. Okay, you say, let's look up Gihon and let's see what we get. This is some examples of, of search results that I got looking up Gihon. But then I'm on the map, they're all over here. <laughs> the Nile is there. And you know, maybe we're talking about the Blue Nile, which is actually somewhere down here. Um, and this was a, particular good, a particularly good one in my, in my particular text, because Matthew talks about the Gihon River. And the person who translated, in, translated the text into English thought that he was talking about the Jehan River, which is a Turkish name for a river that the Greeks called the Pyramus River which ran in southern Turkey, around the place that the Armenians were. So this guy, Matthew of Edessa, who was writing, who was writing the text, he was writing this great prophecy about how the, the Roman emperor was going to rise up against the, um, against the infidel Persians in 50 years, and he was going, it was going to be the, 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 last, the last great battle. I mean, it was clearly apocaly apocalyptic stuff he was talking about, and the Roman emperor was going to come in glory and 
push the Muslims back beyond the river. And some translators looked at that and said, obviously, Matthew was just talking about the Roman emperor coming and cleaning up the, the Persians out of his own land where Armenians lived. And so he just wanted them out of, out of Syria and Cilicia and just a little bit back beyond. Other people think that he was probably talking, you know, he was going all apocalyptic. And so he was probably talking about that river of paradise. So, and the, the problem is compounded, again, talking about names because in the text he calls it Jahuni. And you have to figure out what the Armenian Jahuni River means. And this is why it became, you know, for this, for this other scholar it became Jehan, and for me it became Gihon. Um, because, and when we're doing history, we have to have some way, you know, I might be wrong, he might be wrong, how do we represent that? Okay. So now we come to the last war, which isn't really a war story, and more of a state of heightened tensions, which is what I've been getting at for, for the last little bit of RAN. Now, people in the sciences and many people in the digital humanities, we like to bring scientific method and scientific falsifi falsifiability to all sorts of pursuit of knowledge. And, you know, there's a good reason for that. It's, um, as Feynman says, the, the easiest person to fool is yourself. All of these textual scholars who are looking at a text and convincing themselves that this reading, you know, that, that this reading must work, function this way on the stemma so that their other reading down here then will be the correct one to adopt on the stemma, and that makes so much sense to them, and so it must be true. That is the sort of thinking that it's all too easy to fall into in the humanities. Um, also with, you know, the, histori the historical examples. You know, I have, my, I have my firm belief that Matthew probably meant the Gihon River. Dostorian has his firm belief that Matthew probably meant the Jehan River. Um, how do you even begin to falsify that or test it? But we can't have science without humanities. Um, and we have barely begun trying to bring computation to the humanities. Uh, the thing about engineers, and you know, in, in most of these cases, I'm an engineer too. Um, the thing about engineers is that we really like to solve about 80, 90% of a problem. You know, when we automate something away, we automate all except the corner cases. Because we figure, well, you know, now we've saved ourselves 95% of the work and the corner cases can be done by hand and that'll only take me 10 minutes, right? Um, the humanities is made of corner cases. This is the fundamental problem. Um, and so when you solve 80% of a problem, then in the eyes of a lot of humanities people, you haven't really solved the problem at all. When you take these, when you take these shortcuts, or uh, as soon as, when you're working in the humanities, as soon as you say the words, let's assume for a minute, then you're gonna have a problem. And any old school textual scholar can tell you that these corner cases are where we do have to resort to creativity and intuition and judgment. We have to be able to think to ourselves, which, is it likely that a scribe in 1573 would have figured out that this was nonsense and that this other reading should have, should have applied instead? Um, can we figure out that where this, where this text says electric, it really should have said eclectic. You know, I can, I can see that obviously because of my superior wit and, wit and intellect, but could someone in 1672 have seen that? Um, or this is, I don't know, or another, another example I like is a text that a colleague of mine works on in which there are some, there are a few manuscripts that have glosses, meaning notes in the margins uh, with, you know, words marked and then some note in the margin defining the word or explaining the word. And some of these, a few of these manuscripts have these glosses. And at first she thought, great, so that means that they're probably related because they have the exact same glosses in the exact same places. And then she realized that the glosses in question came from a, came from a, um, a sort of medieval thesaurus that was very common and very widespread at the time. 
So now she has to contend with the possibility that maybe there were three different scribes working on three different texts, copied from three different exemplars, who all had access to this thesaurus, and who were putting, putting in the glosses and copying it word for word from that other text. And you have to make that judgment, and you have to rely on this intuition at the same time that you're holding your intuition at arm's length, um, because you're not quite sure what to do with it. And we have to use all of these human faculties that basically lead us to trouble, but also lead us to art, and also lead us to genius and beauty. So the motto of Pearl is that there's more than one way to do it. Um, it's, good, it's, a good motto, it's a good motto, and it's a good philosophy, and there is, that there's more than one way to approach a problem, and whichever way you choose, you'll probably get there in the end. But here's a challenge for engineers who are interested in the hard problems. There's, there's a good challenge for you, right? This is a hard problem. Come in, come in. If you think you're smart, come and try and do this. Um, which is to start to think about how we can get the computer to help us handle things like there's, one, there's more than one thing it could do. There's more than one way this there, there's one mo more than one way this could be interpreted. There's more than one thing this could mean. Art thrives on interpretation, and art loves ambiguity because when you have when you have something in art that you have to stop and think about, that's what really pulls people in, and that's what makes it successful. Engineering tends to avoid ambiguity like the plague. You don't want to know whether that bridge might fail if someone is walking on it with a with a different sort of step than you might normally expect. But historians know, and textual scholars know, that ambiguity and Im interpretation, they aren't their own beasts. They're also subject to logic. We have, and textual scholarship is a good example of this again, because we have to use our intuition, but we have to rein in our intuition, and we have to find a way to make our intuition coexist with our logic. And we have to find a way to allow ourselves to be wrong, even when it's a matter of interpretation. And creativity needs to be grounded in reason, just like reason sometimes needs to resort to creativity. And so that's where I'll leave it for you. This, I'll, I'll let you think about that as we have this conference full of art and engineering and how the two go together and when to, um, when to trust intuition and when to be suspicious of intuition and how intuition helps us figure out what we're doing here. Thanks very much. Okay, I don't know what comes next. That's kind of dangerous, actually. Um, the problem is that yeah. uh, the question was, you can use the text variation to build a tree. And so does that mean that you can then use the tree to try to sort out the chronology of, a te the co chronology of text copies? And the answer is kind of yes and no, with a little bit more emphasis on the no than the yes. <laughs> there, there's ambiguity for you. But the basic trouble is that a text, so you might have, let me find that slide. So if you, if you have a stemma like this, then let's say that top dot was 1372, and the next dot was 1423, and on down, and let's say that this one was eventually sort of 1589. But there's nothing stopping A from ha having been 1934. And so A is much, much closer to the root, but it might be the youngest manuscript. Um, and you might, see, you might see a text that was copied in 1587, and you might say, oh, well, this isn't so far compared to 1923, and actually it's you know, one of the worst of the lot in terms of distance away, distance away from the archetype. 
So the problem of dating manuscripts is different in different fields. Now, I work in Armenian studies primarily, and I have the great advantage that in, Armenians, in Armenian um, textual copying practice, it was quite normal to leave notes in the manuscript saying, you know, Praise be, praise be to God, I have finally finished this text in, in the year 1623, and my name is, you know, my name is, um, is Ashot, please God have mercy on my parents and remember me, you know, remember this sinful scribe. Something like that, that's very common. And so we often, though not always, have dates for Armenian manuscripts. In Greek manuscripts, you don't have any of that. Um, you have only the style of writing. That's usually how you, that's usually what you use to date a text is what's called paleography, so the style of writing, and you compare it to uh, samples of, of writing style in different, in different centuries. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can, also, you can also do things, if the texts are old enough, then you can use different dating methods on them. I saw a very interesting paper not long ago about, um, actually two papers, one of them was talking about ultraviolet imaging techniques and the other was talking about infrared inter imaging techniques that would identify the, e the sort of ink that was used on a manuscript and knowing the sort of ink that was used would give you information about when and where it might have been copied. So in general, to date a manuscript, you have to go on the physical features and less on the text that it contains. Your answers would often be probabilistic or have some probability associated with them because you've been through a series of probability calculations. Is it, is it common practice when you, when you present an answer to give uh, a probability of correctness with it in, 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 a, in, a, humanitarian, in a humanities context? Would, 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 would people tend to do that or, or is it a foreign? Okay. Um, the question is, um, a lot of this stuff seems like it would be tractable by probabilistic methods, and do, is it common to give some sort of probabilistic measure when we talk about these things in the humanities? Um, the answer is, when I see a probabilistic measure in a humanities paper, I have deep suspicion in my heart, and I read the paper much more carefully, because the problem is, we use the, this is very common in the sciences, but in the humanities, we don't have a lot of good probabilistic models. We know, we're pretty sure by now, I'm, I'm certainly pretty sure, although there are philologists who will still argue with me, that spelling can be significant, and if we only had a good probabilistic model for how often spelling gets copied blindly versus how often the scribe's own native spelling uh, takes over, then we could use that sort of signal to try and figure out the, the history of manuscripts to some extent. But Historians know, th or I shouldn't say historians, humanities people know that they should be, you know, that, that science is sort of reigning supreme at the moment and that they, they are expected to be more rigorous and more scientific in their methods. The problem is many of them have very poor grounding in statistics. And so you'll see, oh, and this is, this is significant because it's, it's P is less than, than 0.05. Um, yeah, my sample size was 12. <laughs> And the problem is sometimes you can't have a sample size bigger than 12. Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. I had a paper recently where I had to resort to some strange statistical tricks that probably made some other people a little bit suspicious of me because I was looking at, my, the question I wanted to answer was that when, a, when an editor looks at a textual tradition and they see that they have to pick out these significant common errors, the ones that they think are definitely telling of which way the stemma should be oriented, and I had a set of artificial traditions, meaning that um, they were copied by volunteers over, over the course of a couple of weeks, and the volunteers didn't know which text they were copying, and they, did, they weren't told anything except, you know, copy out this text by hand. And what that means is that we have the true stemma of this text that was copied by different people who had different facility, of, you know, different language facility. We have exactly three of these traditions. That's the entire size of the data set that I have. And I found five philologists who would, who would be my subjects, which is to say who would do the classification. The idea was to see how often, how good their guesses were as to which, which errors were significant. Uh, and so it was very hard to come up with something that 
satis that would satisfy anyone as to say statistical significance, but there aren't 30 philologists of old Finnish who I can pull. You know, I, I can't get I can't get a sample size of 100 in that sense, and there aren't there aren't a thousand texts that could be classified for which I know the stemma. And so this is our problem with, you know, so there, we can apply probability sometimes. It's done more often in, in modern literature where you, have, where you have Google Books and you have really, for the humanities, enormous data sets on which you can start looking at statistical models. It's done there, but the places where it can be done are fairly limited. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that is another thing, is that the, the names might be referring to two completely distinct places for completely obvious reasons, if you know the history of the, um, <laughs> of the book. Yes, and it's, it's one of those things that is probably the hardest, the hardest thing for humanities people and engineering people to bridge is this matter of definition. You were saying there was working with humanities people, you find that it's very hard, for the, it's very hard to nail down the, with them a precise definition of something. Um, yeah. I was helping a biologist who was preparing a, a publication on some biomedical stuff, and she was doing some significance tests, like you mentioned. And she was changing the data as long as she got the significance. <laughs> she was pushing them around in the Excel sheet till, she, till it uh, changed from green to red, from red to green. And then she had the significance, and this was a publication. Yeah, that's, that's also a way I've heard of cycling doping tests being done for that matter, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and, it, it, and you know, so part of, part of what I'm trying to do here is to sort of start to push you guys into thinking why it is, you know, the humanities people, they aren't just, we aren't just being difficult. We, we, we're not just doing it because we like to argue. We're doing it because we have always got an exception in our head, and the exception is something that we actually have to deal with, and we know that there's probably another exception that we don't know about yet, in terms of actually constructing, <laughs> constructing any workable, usable model of what we're doing. Um, now, now that said, there are people in the humanities that do like argument, don't get me wrong, but it's not just that. <laughs> uh, are you raising your hand? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing it. It's a nice idea, though. And this this thing was just used for the example. Now I have now part the now what I do in the humanities is only a very tiny sli sliver of what <coughs> is done in the humanities. So what I am doing is teaching students the Google Places API, so that they can 
they can use it in their own research. I had a student project last term in which a student of linguistics was mapping, mapping um, language dialects in the region of Dagestan and using Google Places to do this. Um, as for, but generally at the moment, if you are working with a data set that contains ambiguous or allegorical names, you probably steer, steer well away from any automatic identification of them. Okay, um, if there are no other comments, then I suppose since there's no one taking the mic from me, it's up to me to say go have coffee. <laughs> Okay. Um.